So it's Gollum. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord of the Rings character. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So thank you for coming to the talk. I know Nextdoor's got a cool talk, so I appreciate you guys coming to this one. Um, so Gollum, one anti-phishing bot to rule them all. Um, this is a phishing bot that uh, deals with reported phishing to our bank. So I'm going to get started. So who we are. So that's me. This is uh, Benny. And he's over here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so those are our Twitter handles. Uh, I've got about five followers. So I'll give my sixth follower a free beer. My seventh <laughs> will get two free beers. And so on until I run out of money. And that'll be uh, sooner than you guys think. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe like three beers, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we both work at ABSA in the cybersecurity team. We work uh, on automation uh, on a tool, a group of tools known as a SOAR tool. We've only got one. Uh, so that stands for Security Orchestration Automation and Response. And we built this uh, bot together. Okay, so what phishing are we talking about here? Um, and why was this developed? So the phishing that we're talking about here is credential phishing. So the company being targeted will uh, be, their website will be scraped in some way, and a clone of that website will be created. Then uh, a phishing email will be sent to a client of this company. They'll open that. It'll open in a web page. They'll fill in their credentials, and then their data is stolen. So that's the phishing that we're talking about. And why was this developed? So, ABSA is a huge target of phishing. And when you report phishing to ABSA, it goes to a mailbox. So you report it via email. You just forward your phishing mail uh, to ABSA. Now, this mailbox, um, it was manually monitored, right? So uh, it would take several days for you to get a response if you reported an email to this mailbox. And also, uh, you know, we want to take these things down as quickly as possible. So if we're only responding to you a few days after you sent us a phishing mail, that means that website's also only being taken down a few days after you knew about it and after we should have known about it and actioned it. So we've automated that mailbox and also automated other ways to detect phishing, which I'm going to get into. So we've got a methodology that we came up with to end-to-end um, -end deal with this phishing problem. So we've got detection, classification, confirmation, reporting, and tracking. So under detection, we use client emails that go to this mailbox that I was talking about. We pull those emails and uh, try to classify them next step. Then we use referral logs. So I'm going to go into what a referral log is and how you can use it to detect phishing. And then we use anti-phishing feeds. So there's a lot of anti-phishing feeds on the internet. Then we uh, classify. So we use the HTTP GET requests. Um, the HTML content on the page, and then image recognition to we screenshot the page and then classify it that way as well. And then we need to confirm because all of these can be error prone. So to confirm, we use a Telegram bot, and you can also confirm in the application that we developed, which I'll show you a bit later. Um, then reporting. So as we know about something, we want to report it immediately because we want to get it blocked on browsers and we want the website to be taken down. So we report to anti-phishing feeds. The main one, the most useful one that we report to is Fish Tank. And then uh, we report to our anti-phishing vendor. And that's because uh, we can't always take down the sites ourselves because there's different geolocations that these sites are in. So different languages get spoken in those countries. So you need to be able to uh, effectively communicate to get the site taken down. And then we track. So end to end, we track phishing sites. We want to make sure that they stay down and don't get reactivated because the sites that get hacked to host the phishing sites often don't get patched. So the phishing kit gets deleted, but then it's up there a week later again. OK, so the architecture that we use. So we've got Gollum, which is on our network. And then we've got Shelob, which is off the network. So these are two EC2 instances, so two um, separate servers. And we use Gollum as the brain of the application. And uh, Shelob is basically a, a taskmaster. So, so Gollum sends requests to Shelob via an API. And then Shelob will do the web scraping that we need. So Shelob is a spider and web scraping. So that's why we chose that name. And Gollum, for you Lord of the Rings nerds, loves fish. So that's where we got 
in that problem. Yeah. So. Uh, we'll get to that. Yeah. Also, can we just save the questions for the end? I'll answer that in the talk. Yeah. Um, so, Gollum doesn't need internet to communicate so, or, or to do its job. It uses Shelob for that. So, Gollum is on your network, and basically, if someone gets into your network, they can get to Gollum. But otherwise, um, you don't want to visit phishing sites on your network. So, that's what Shelob's for. So, your proxy isn't being filled with. Um, a bunch of requests to phishing sites. And both applications were written in Python, and we use the Django framework. Yeah. So now I've, uh, the methodology we're going to go through, so in the top right, you can see which one we're on, and also down the left-hand side. So we're on detect now. So the first method of detection that I mentioned was via email. So there's a client busy reporting a phishing mail. And now we need to say, do we need uh, internet to read this email or not? So if we're using Microsoft Exchange, then that email is going to be on our network. And then we don't need Shelob to fetch the email. But if um, it's uh, off the network, then Gollum doesn't have internet access. Uh, I mean, if it's on the network, then Gollum can just fetch the email. So you can read those uh, windows in your best Gollum accent in your head. Okay, the second method we've got for detection is using the refer logs. So this is basically the web scraping that you were referring to. So when a phishing site is spawned, if that phishing site or phishing kit wants to stay current, so always wants to look like your website, then they've got to pull dynamically pull the content from your website. So just about what a refer log is, it's the log that tells you how the person got to your website. So if um, you Google um, a website, let's say PayPal, for example. You Google PayPal, and then you click on the PayPal link inside of Google. Then on PayPal's referrer logs, they will see um, Google over here. So the referrer that referred you to them is going to be Google. And then all of your details are also in that referrer log. So we've got your IP address, we've got um, your user agent, and the date and time that the request was made. So this is very useful for detecting phishing, but we can also use it to protect our clients. So um, if we take your IP address, we take your user agent, and we take that timestamp, we can correlate all of that data against our internet banking logins. So we can say, oh, that IP address was seen logging into internet banking with that user agent at a similar time to that. So now we know with a high likelihood that that client has visited a phishing site and then fraud can contact that client because we'll have the um, session data uh, associated with that IP address at the time, which is quite cool. Um, then we've got the, uh, the request type, so the HTTP request that was made. And you're going to get a lot of gets, gets coming through, not many posts, because um, you know, it's trying to pull content from your site. And then the file. Uh, type is also very important because that's going to be static content. So if it's pulling things like images, JavaScript, CSS, that kind of static data is what we um, care about for phishing. And then the last thing is the phishing page. So that refer log over there actually tells us the website that was pulling this data. So when a client visits the phishing site, they generate this log in our logs, and then we can see that phishing site. So now we've got the phishing site because a client visited the site, the phishing site, or the frauds who spun the sites up visited the site. So now we've actually got the website. Now we need to do something with it. So to, this is like our architecture, but I'm sure most companies would have this. So you've got your website, and then the logs would be come into your seam or log aggregator. And then we've got Gollum over here that makes an API call into the seam to fetch the refer log. So basically, it's just a, a search um, in whatever language your seam uses. OK, so on to classifying emails now. Uh, so we pass, so an email will come into the mailbox, and we've got a script that fetches the emails every minute and puts them on a memory queue. And then we get the HTML attachments out of the email, and we get the links out of the email. Just, uh, we just pass that data out of the email. Then we load the data into a headless browser. So a headless browser is a browser on a server that's not connected to a screen, hence um, headless. And it still can take screenshots, though. So 
you can load a page in a headless browser and still take a screenshot. And people use them for like unit tests and that sort of thing as well. So we get the HTTP status of the website. There's no point in even starting this if the site's already down, if it's a 404 or 500 or something. Then we get the HTML content. So this can tell us the structure of the page. And the structure of phishing sites also is similar. They, they vary a lot, but like a whole group of phishing sites will have a similar structure. Um, then we get the get requests, like we've spoken about, those are important. And then we get a screenshot of the page. And then the screenshot is sent to an AI model. And uh, we train this. Um, I'll talk about that now. And then the AI model classifies it as being a specific brand. So if it, if it matches our brand, then we know this phishing belongs to us. So a word on AI. Um, so we're using transfer learning to train our model. And transfer learning is really cool because it's basically a big neural network. The one that we're using is from TensorFlow. And they've got a model that can basically do like widespread recognition. So it can recognize humans, cars, dogs, people's faces. And we take that network and we remove the last few layers of the network, so the last um, before the classification. And then we give it our data set and say retrain. And then it retrains and just makes up the last few layers. So the previous layers are all about um, feature extraction, and the last few layers are all about uh, classifi classifying the data. And why that's really cool is you can use a really small data set but still get a high accuracy, which is unusual for neural nets. You usually need a lot of data to get a good accuracy. So we also have the black box of AI. So word on the street is no theory exists for why these models work so well. So we know they work because, I mean, they're on everyone's phone classifying your face, but we don't always know when they won't work. So there's a lot of guesswork involved with what data you need, how much data you need, and th they can be error prone and quite buggy. So pornography here is a weird one to have on the slide, but basically we've been running this uh, bot for about a year, and we've been taking screenshots of phishing sites or websites that are reported to us via email, and you know spam comes into the email, and we sometimes get uh, links that take us to websites that you wouldn't want to be on. So our bots has taken pictures of a few nude women. And then it would ask us, please classify this, right? So then it sends the whole team a picture of a nude, <laughs> nude lady, <laughs> which some people would really enjoy in the team. Which is <laughs> yeah. So we've ironed out those bugs. And that's basically just the data set that we chose in the beginning. We didn't know what would be sent to us, right? So um, we didn't have pornographic images in our non-phishing data set. We don't now either, but we've got at least pictures of people. <laughs> okay, and then classifying the refer log. So that's the um, log that was in a previous slide. We write a regex to extract the pieces out of that log file, uh, log line. And then we get the referrer. And then we get the HTTP status of the referrer. So as well, if it's not 200, we don't carry on, or under 300. And then we get the get requests and classify the get requests. And we can't use image recognition at this layer because the referrer um, is maybe a CSS file, which isn't going to look like our brand. It's just going to be a, a lot of plain text in the browser. So the get requests tell us what content that CSS file is fetching from our page. And then we've got a threshold for if it fetches enough static data from our page, then we know, OK, this is very likely to be phishing. So then we advance to the next block where we try to guess what the actual phishing site is. So if, you know, if you're familiar with Durbuster or GoBuster and word lists for uh, brute forcing, uh, we basically have our own word list that brute forces uh, for the phishing, actual phishing page. And we just get 404s, 404s, and then we get like a 200 on the page. And then we load that in a headless browser, screenshot that, and then classify it in a similar way to the way we were classifying um, the email. OK, then on to verification. So we've spoken about classifying. Now we need to verify whether these things are, in fact, phishing and not pornographic pictures. So um, they used to confirm uh, a phishing page. And this is what our bot currently looks like. So it'll send you a picture and a URL and then ask you, is this phishing or is this not phishing? And uh, you can report phishing to the bot as well. You can receive statistics from the bot. So we've got uh, use cases <coughs> like a manager might want to see statistics, um, how well is the application performing. And then the devs want to see errors uh, in the application. So we send error logs to our Telegram bot as well, but just for the dev users. And then we, um, our analysts confirm whether um, pictures are phishing or not. Okay, on to reporting. So like I said, we report all of our 
fish to fish tank and then also to our anti-phishing vendor. And fish tank unfortunately doesn't have an API for submission. They've only got an API to pull um, data from them. So we use web scraping and we log in with an initial user that will report the um, web page. And then we've got four verification users that log in after that user and verify that fish. Because, um, yeah, so it's like sneaky, but. <laughs> um, so this is what Google Safe Browsing does. About 30 minutes after we report a site, we get uh, this showing up on all of our phishing sites, which is pretty cool. Sometimes it doesn't always get marked as phishing, even after our verification thing, but we've got about a 95% hit rate on that. And then our uh, reporting to vendors, um, we support everything at the moment except OAuth, so uh, we'll get into that later in the talk. Then we want to track the fish to make sure that websites go down and stay down. Um, we, re we revisit these websites, so we keep them in the database and visit them uh, you know, if it was up, then we'll visit it every hour. If it was down, we'll visit it maybe once or twice a day. And, and if it's down for a long period of time, maybe once a week, we'll visit it. So we check the HTTP status. That's the easiest way to tell whether something's gone down. But sometimes it stays on a 200. For example, when our uh, anti-phishing vendor sometimes just will put their uh, image over the page to take it down. So the content will stay 200 but the phishing content's actually not there anymore. So we also have to look at whether the HTML contents has changed. Um, the, yeah, sites will be reactivated, so you might visit a closed site and now it's open again. Like I said, the websites that are hacked to host phishing aren't always patched, so we see that quite often. And we've seen our IP address and user agents blocked as well. You know, so in the phishing kit, we, when we analyze the phishing kit, we'll say like, oh, those are our IP addresses in this list of IPs that are getting blocked. But you know, that's not unique. All the anti-phishing vendors' IPs are also blocked, so they also have to use proxies. So we have a script that fetches uh, proxies every morning for us, just open source South African proxies. And then, uh, well, open source is probably the wrong word, but free South African proxies. And then we uh, use those proxies and use uh, randomized user agents to visit the sites. OK, so that's the end end to end how we deal with phishing. I just want to talk about the architecture before the demo. So this would be um, your company. Then like I said, Gollum doesn't have internet access, but is in a VPC that's connected to your company. And then we have a non-connected VPC that has Shelob in it, so that Shelob can uh, visit the uh, internet for Gollum. So the logs for referral logs come into the seam, and then uh, we use Microsoft Exchange. So uh, a client will report an email to us, and then Gollum will go and fetch those emails from Exchange every minute. That's just a cron job that runs. And those emails are then queued in a memory queue on Gollum, and then Gollum will pass the email and extract uh, the links, HTML attachments, send that to Shelob, and then Shelob will do all of the analysis that I was talking about, and then send back the classification back to Gollum. If the, if the site is classified as um, being ABSA, then Gollum will take uh, the screenshot, um, HTML content, and GET requests and store it in the S3 bucket, and then we'll also create um, a database entry, so we're using the relational database service from AWS, just a MySQL database. And we've got some web application firewalls um, there and there, so that's the egress one, so we can only talk to Telegram. Gollum actually, or Telegram scripts uh, always pull Telegram, even if you send Telegram a, a message, it's probably a webhook, it's, uh, yeah. so, so it always will be polling Telegram, uh, so Telegram never has to push anything to Gollum if you request for stats or anything like that. So this is all one-way traffic, no one can um, talk in there. And then this web application firewall only, only will accept connections from that VPC. And then for authentication, uh, this has got Django uh, REST framework on it, so it's using a token. And then the API, API gateway from AWS also um, has got token authentication. Yeah, so in, end to end, just to finish, so uh, the RDS database now has the phishing email in it. And then uh, a Telegram message is sent, you know, saying, is this phishing? When someone clicks yes, what happens is uh, Gollum then will tell Shelob to report this phishing site. And also, 
um, before that verification, the client also gets responded to. So if we've seen that phishing before, then you'll get a notification very quickly that this is a phishing site that's been seen before. But if it's a new phishing site, then we'll send you something that says, um, like, we think this is phishing. You should be careful with this email. Okay, so we use Terraform uh, to deploy our infrastructure. It's actually a requirement at the bank to use Terraform and Ansible to deploy into AWS. Um, so basic, what it does, it's a bunch of configuration scripts for your infrastructure. You run a command on your computer, and it takes all of those configs and says, OK, this is what you want to build in your AWS or Google Cloud Platform or Azure. So it's uh, cross-platform. And then you, it'll also tell you, like, this is what I'm going to build. And then you can agree to that and accept and send that through. So we've got Terraform scripts um, that everybody can use for managing their infrastructure as well. Then uh, Ansible to automate deployment. So it's also configuration scripts. Then it connects via SSH to your infrastructure and then will deploy um, code for you. It'll run commands to install <coughs> software. So it'll install, I've got the list at the bottom here. So we're installing Nginx and SSL certificates using Ansible and then installing Django. We're using virtual environments and Unicorn installs all of those. And then it installs Chrome and MITM, uh, the man in the middle proxy we're using to get the GET requests that are uh, made. And Chrome uh, is also installed. And then basically, when everything's finished installing, it starts up your application for you. So after you've run your Terraform and Ansible scripts, the whole platform is up and running. OK, time for a demo. <laughs> so I've bought uh, my fiance here as a sacrifice to the demo gods. So. <laughs> If everything goes well, we won't have to sacrifice her there. <laughs> yeah. So this is the. We're not seeing your, we're not seeing your screen. Oh, thank you. Oh, got to drag that over. Done that more than once. Okay. So this is the platform that we developed. Um, basically, when you deploy all of this with Terraform and Ansible then you will be greeted with this as the welcoming screen. So it's the first screen to onboard your company onto the platform. So you can put in the company name and company website. And uh, when you click Next, it's immediately going to start training a model for that website. So Chrome is going to go uh, visit that website, take screenshots of what the website looks like, and then duplicate that into a folder, delete the old model, retrain a new one. And then, you, then you've got your company onboarded. And what's cool about that is you can onboard multiple companies onto the platform. So if you like a bank like ABSA, we've got um, other banks in Africa. We look after some of their security as well and their phishing. So we can onboard them and their mailboxes onto this platform. So the model can classify more than one uh, uh, company. And another thing that's cool about that is if you've got a competitor's um, phishing email, so you know where to report a competitor's phishing mail to, then you can on onboard your competitor. And if something is classified as your competitor, then you could just send that email straight off to them. You don't have to uh, send it to an analyst mailbox, so you're also saving them time that way. OK, so I'm not going to train a model now. I was going to, but what happens is the that initial model that you get from TensorFlow is downloaded and stored in the temp directory. And then I shut down my laptop yesterday, which means my temp directory is gone, which means it's going to have to re-download that model. So I'm not going to um, do that. But I've got a few things trained for later. So I'm just going to say skip for now. This would be the referrer log onboarding. So whatever seam you're using, you'd put the seam details in here. And um, that would be your search string to pull out your referrer logs. And then you can put in your um, Directory brute forcing guesses in there as well. So the API, so we're using Risk IQ, um, their <coughs> API for getting the who is details, SSL information, and some open source uh, threat sharing information about all the websites in the platform. So all that data gets stored as well. What's very useful about that is you can see uh, the registrant's email sometimes in. Uh, the who is details. So if a fraudster spins up a website and they do put a fake email in there, that can help you correlate to other phishing kits. But also if 
um, it's a hacked website, which 90% of the time it is, then you can get the hacked website's registrant's email and send them an email and tell them, hey, your uh, website's been hacked. So email configuration, so just inbound and outbound email. And the outbound email is, it uses the same credentials as that. So this is actually for the analyst's email. So you'll have an email coming in. If you can't process it, you need some way to send that email. So that's what those, those are for so that someone else can look at that. Um, then we've got fish tank details over here, so the reporting user and all the verification users. And then your anti-phishing vendors details, and like I said, it doesn't support OAuth yet, so you'd put in your username and password would help uh, with OAuth authentication, but um, on the back end, it's not there yet. Let's skip for now. Okay, so that's just verification to show that everything was successful. Now I'm going to move on to sandbox. Okay, so let me show you. Um, okay, so this is not ABSA. This is an HTML attachment that's on my uh, machine. And this is just a phishing uh, site that I created. So this is very typical. So someone will email you an HTML attachment in the email. You'll click on the attachment. You think it's your statement. You fill in your credentials like this, and then it doesn't take you to your statement. So put in like an account number and a password, and then I click Next. And now those credentials were actually just submitted to uh, that site. So now there's a PHP script there. It's not an HTML attachment anymore. And so this is just an image, which is also very common in phishing sites. So I'm going to submit that HTML attachment to the sandbox in Gollum. So if I click on this, so that fish.html. So that's the uh, phishing website. Now, this does take a while. What's happening now is Gollum is talking to Shelob. It sent it the phishing link. It's going to load that in a headless browser, take a screenshot of that, and then uh, bring all the details back here with what it thinks is the actual phishing site because you can't report an HTML attachment either. You can't report that to um, Fish Tank because they don't care about HTML attachments. They want the link that's the phishing site. And you can't report it to your anti-phishing vendor because then they first have to uh, figure out what the phishing link is like you should be doing and then send that straight to them. So there's the screenshot of what that HTML attachment looks like. And you can see here this is the receive creds PHP file, which was um, where the credentials were posted to. Um, so if I click on extracted links, you can see it's a 200, and basically that's how we found that link. And then I'm going to show you another example. So PayPal's login. Yeah. So PayPal, I don't know if it's still like this, but when I started work here a few years ago, they were huge targets of phishing. So, <laughs> okay. So we'll we'll wait. So what's happening again now is that link is being sent to Gollum, but this time it's a link. So Gollum doesn't have to figure out what the actual phishing site is in the attachment. There's uh, the HTTP GET requests are going to appear here the SSL information there, the who is information there. Um, so yeah, I can show you. So there's the screenshot from PayPal. Luckily, there's good internet. So here's the geolocation for PayPal. Um, then it says PayPal target 99% probability. So the model that we've got on the back end, we've trained it on a few things. PayPal is one of them. We've also trained it on ABSA. Um, HTTP, there's get information, the SSL information. A thing to mention here is the Lexa rank, which is not. OK, so not all of this data seems to have been pulled through. That's OK. So um, the Lexa rank is usually um, shown in the SSL information. And PayPal's got quite a high Lexa rank. So what that is, it's the Lexa top million, which is the top million websites visited, um, I think it's on an on-rolling basis, probably. So Google is number one. Uh, and PayPal is in the top 100, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's just like the, it's supposed to have the values here. 
you know, which it's not doing. That's OK. And then uh, why that's cool, though, is if you see phishing sites that have a high Alexa rank, then um, I think they'll be taken more seriously because you know these sites are popular and they've been hacked and now someone's hosting phishing on them. So we'll probably write like a rule that says if their Alexa rank is higher than 5,000 notifiers via Telegram because then it's a fun story. Um, then the who is data, the registrant email. So I spoke about that. You could send that email uh, a notification saying your website's been hacked. Then extracted links. So the HTML was fetched. So that, that's the HTML, raw HTML content of PayPal. And then we don't have phishing kit analysis yet or trying to find raw creden credentials. And open source threat intelligence is uh, blank now as well because PayPal is yeah, not malicious. So. Okay, this is our fish board. So we've got, um, th these are just examples. So it's the example that I just uploaded now. And we can click on details. So this would list all of the phishing sites for the organization. You can search by, by target. So the different companies that you've onboarded would be searchable and date time and filters and all that. So details. So here's the details for this specific phishing site. So it was a shortfall in our previous um, iteration of this app is we didn't have a way to drill down into the phishing sites to look in more, in more detail. Um, but there's the get requests, extracted links, the who is information is there, so you can uh, look at all of that in the platform as well. And then something else is if this wasn't ABSA, or it wasn't being classified as ABSA, like if the probability here was much lower, then you could go edit target and then select um, which targets it was. So the, these are all the companies I've onboarded, so the model would recognize any four of those things. And then you can tell it how, how much, how important is it that the model detects this thing as being that brand the next time. What this is gonna do, it goes and screenshots this page, uh, then replicates it and puts it in the data set with all the other uh, data for, this, for that specific target and then retrains the model. So it makes it more accurate for the next time it's classifying that image. Um, then we've got statistics, so uh, total sites for December. Um, well, all of these little uh, cards at the top here just show like uh, details for the day or for the month and year. Then we've got geolocation of where all our fishing sites are. We've got um, sites per month as the year's gone on. So this is actual ABSA data, so you can see we receive a hell of a lot of uh, fishing. Then this is phishing kit attribution. So how, what percentages do we think, uh, you know, if, if there's four phishing kits targeting us, then 30% is this phishing kit. And we just take the last file of the phishing kits and, you know, that becomes like the name for the phishing kit. I think that's the demo. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the slides now. Yeah, we don't have to sacrifice Ellen. <laughs> okay, some statistics. So I find these really interesting. So 2.3% of all of the phishing that we see is reported from Gmail users. And that's tiny um, compared to the number of people that use Gmail. So we think um, two things are contributing to this. The one is there's no data set for Gmail users that belongs to South Africans. So if that existed, I'm sure they'd be targeted a lot more. And um, there might be that data set, I don't know, I'm just guessing there's not. And I think that Gmail's got pretty decent security. And the second thing is Google Safe Browsing blocks phishing sites and we know that they do the same for email. So as soon as we report a phishing site to Fish Tank, 30 minutes later or whenever Gmail cons or uh, Google consumes that data, they block it via email as well. So I, I think fraudsters just have a hard time targeting Gmail users so they don't, um, yeah, we don't see a lot of Gmail users infected. So carry on using Gmail if you are. And then um, SSL pages. So, you know, a lot of people think like SSL is safe, which I think hopefully no one in the room thinks like, oh yeah, it's 100% safe because SSL. But we, 
have seen, so 32% of our phishing pages have an SSL certificate installed on them. And this is because it's just a hacked website. So if the website that gets hacked has got a HTTPS uh, or SSL cert installed, then the phishing site's also going to have an SSL cert. And this grew from 16% in 2018, which is like very interesting because browsers have been mentioning that they're going to stop supporting uh, HTTP. And then 74% of our email reports come from these four uh, people. So if anyone works here, <laughs> fix your email security. No, but I, I don't think they to blame, actually. I think that it's very easy for, for fraudsters to say, OK, telcomsa.net, that's a South African market. So if we find any emails with that um, URL, you know, send a phishing mail to them. And it's the same with all of these. These are very specific to South Africa, and I think that's why we see them targeted, not always because their filtering is not good. OK, then future work that we want to do. So we want to automate the analysis of phishing kits. So get out where, where's the phishing kit posting the information to, um, what emails are being used in the phishing kit. Then we want to do credential hunting. So um, when the phishing kit can't post or email the credentials out, then what it often does is just writes the credentials to a TXT file on the server or to a, a database file. And then we can go and find that file and then alert our customers who have been phished. So ABSA um, does this manually at the moment, but we want to automate that. And then uh, we want to automate emails to the owners of websites, like I mentioned earlier, from the who is information. And uh, these, these last three are basically, so the SIEM integration, we want to beef that up to make uh, queries to your SIEM to say, have you seen any of these phishing sites? And we want to also do proxy integration. So we, we integrated in our proxy, but we, we want to support more proxies. So uh, we block phishing immediately on our proxy as we know about it. And then uh, we want to feed our customers. So we have a free AV to all our customers. We want to feed our phishing data to that AV as well. And then we want to build a central sharing platform. So if uh, many people start using this platform, then we can all share the data together. All of our proxies can have these phishing sites blocked. We can do um, like attribution across industries. Um, we can check our post websites the same, email addresses. We could do coordinated takedowns. We just like start working better together. And maybe even get ISPs behind us to block phishing sites like at a South African level. That would be cool. And then this is all being open sourced. So I currently don't have an open source link at the moment because uh, we need to do due diligence. Our risk officer was wanted a pen test done, which I agree with. And so that we haven't had time to complete that, which I would have liked. But um, so in January, I suspect the end of January we'll be open sourcing this. But for uh, in the meantime, you can contact me on Twitter or in person afterwards. If you really like this, we'd really, uh, there's still a lot of work to do to get this over the line. So if anyone in the room wants to contribute to this application, that would be um, really great. And also, if you're interested in the feeds that we get after this, so if you have a SIEM that you look after, you can uh, get a feed from us, and we'll happily share that feed with you. You just need to contact me. So thank you very much. I just want to mention the contributors. So Benny over here who has been working a hell of a lot on this in the last few weeks and made the website look so pretty. Otherwise, it would look terrible. And then uh, Justin Gifford, who's actually a volunteer at B-Sides. Uh, he also works at ABSA and helped out on the early iteration of the application. And then Nick Moniella, who's our analyst who works a lot with phishing at ABSA. He uh, contributes a lot in conversation and a lot of ideas and does all of the phishing kit analysis and hunting for credentials. Then I'd like to thank B-Sides Cape Town and the sponsors for such a cool event. Thank you. And the cable. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can follow me on uh, Twitter. And I don't know if anyone's followed me yet. I'll thank you in person. <laughs> can we get a round of applause? <laughs> Lots of people. Who chooses? <laughs> so we've got one the end. Yeah. Uh, the, the three quick ones. Um, okay. I'll, I'll just fire them off and you can answer um, which ones are interesting. Uh, the first thing I want to uh, is the, you mentioned like, um, you know, like excluding status requests with or, or response codes uh, which are unsuccessful. I'm mm. wondering, like, I, like I've, um, in my work, I've seen a lot of times uh, sites just, I've, you know, I've access to give the wrong address, uh, but still serve something that the user sees. 
So I was wondering, like, um, have you looked at sites maybe using that to evade the detection? Like, if they serve, if they serve four and five hundred results. That's very the interesting. Will show them. Yeah. What, what is, I don't know what the browser does if the website tells it 500, but it returns content. Does the, is the browser fine it with that? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, we've come across sites in, um, with other tools in Pearl, not for this, but like, you know, where it assumes 200 codes. And like, you know, but if the site is misconfigured, you go look at why, and it's like they just constantly return like four or five hundred codes, oh. even though the site looks like it works on this. Yeah, that's bad news, because like the, one of the big things that we use to filter out how many sites we have to go visit is the, HTTP status, but that's interesting. Yeah. yeah so Note it down, Benny. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. That'll uh, we'll check that out. And, uh, like similar to that, like, um, do you do much with like mobile versus desktop sites? Um, yeah, we've got an issue with smishing at the moment. Um, so it's it's much more difficult to report smishing as a client because you've got to copy that into an email. You can't just click forward. So we want to uh, bring an easier way to, for clients to report smishing to us, and that's coming in the future where we have a mobile number that you can just forward the smishing to. Okay. No, yeah. I was meaning more like um, for websites. Like, oh. Because uh, the headless browser, I'm assuming, runs in desktop mode? It does. Because you have, like, mobile as well. Yeah. We, we haven't so seen... We, like, we, yeah. haven't, we haven't configured it yet for mobile content, but you can sort of, like, configure the headless browser to load the page. And yeah. You can give it different yeah. resolutions, yeah. 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 If, if we see, yeah, because that would mess with the classification. Also, if we misclassify anything, it goes to our analyst's mailbox. If they see phishing there, they, they know that the bot w failed to detect this as phishing, and then they notify us. Um, so if we see, uh, that's how a lot of the um, uh, improvements have been made on the system. Yeah, so that would be one of them if we saw uh, because of the resolution of the screen, we were misclassifying it, then we would change our resolution. Cool. Yeah. And then the last one is, um, have you looked at the explainable AI um, work that Google is doing with TensorFlow? Uh, like, no. I know that, like, not knowing what the AI is doing. Oh, uh, okay. I think, so, I've, yeah, briefly, not, I can't, not in detail. No, no, no. Yeah. We can chat about it. Yeah, cool. I think uh, might be wrong, but I think you were next. Okay. So, uh, extending on the idea of the credential hunting, I know you guys have thought about breaking in and clearing out the databases and files, and then uh, failing that, maybe just spamming, spawn up a new botnet, yeah. and just introducing noise that they can't deal with, mm. millions of credentials added. Yeah. So, they bo both those things are controversial. Uh, fraudsters leave their back doors up sometimes. We log, uh, you know, I don't want to say we log into them, but <laughs> it's, I, it's, I, I think like lawfully you can't log into that back door. So then we'd also be hacking someone's website if we threw that content off. So we don't do that. Yeah. And, and also spamming them by email. Uh, I, I don't know. We also, we worried about like this is a criminal at the end of the day. And you, you are irritating them a lot if you do that. And you're just doing your job if you do what we're doing. So, okay. yeah. I didn't catch which one of you two was first, so you guys can find it out. <laughs> yeah, just uh, have you, just on uh, the referrals thing specifically, have you guys encountered some more, um, you could say, technical com competent uh, phishing, like uh, actually making use of the no referrer policy? Yes, a hell of a lot, thing? yeah. So when we started the referrer thing, we were getting almost 100% of our phishing mail through the referrers. And now we get maybe 70% through referrers. And a very nice phishing kit in my opinion, but it's also easy for us to detect. Just a base 64 encoded image with the edits over the where the credential should be and one post button that posts. Because that's loading no contents, it's just a yeah. picture with some edits. Yeah. So, last one, last question. Yeah. So, so the solution is aimed more at um, client targeted phishing. Yes. Or, uh, can you maybe adopt the solution and train the model to look at for instance employee phishing where it's like office 365 phishing which you encounter a lot and then skip all referral logs of debunking Microsoft. You, you, you can do that, yeah. So that would be a nice uh, addition onto it. Um, our um, colleagues report phishing either to our internal uh, mailbox that we've got set up for phishing or to our external one. And then if we see something is from uh, an at our domain address, then we respond to that differently because we know, oh, this is a colleague. But the, so our model is very different to the initial onboarding model because we've been doing this for a year. 
Um, so we've got a lot of screenshots of different phishing. So our model is a lot more robust than an initial model for uh, someone would be. So like, for example, Office 365 phishing, that page changes quite regularly. And you've got to update that model regularly, which now the platform deals with really well, but it didn't in the past. So I think it would be a nice um, use case, yeah. Cool. So let's give another round of applause. Thank you.